Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, The Word Webinar. As of yesterday, we had about 225 people registered for the webinar, which is a great turnout and we even have webinar attendees from outside the state of Texas, from Washington State, Canada, Florida, Maryland, New York, Missouri, South Dakota, and more. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website at www txsystemofcare.org within the next couple of weeks. For those of you who tweet, please join online discussion using the hashtag LGBTQ. Also, feel free throughout the patient to post questions for the speakers in the chat pod, and feel free to have a discussion in the chat box. We'll respond either in the chat dialogue to your question, or I will prompt the speakers to reply. At the webinar, there will be a link to the post survey and please complete the survey. Don't forget to complete the survey, especially if you are needing the CEU certificate. At the end of the webinar, we will keep the room open for a short while for any questions or assistance needed. Thank you so much, and without further ado, I would like to turn it over to Mr. Michael Cox. Thank you. All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Robert, and uh, we're looking forward to the webinar today. Um, give you a couple of things. First of all, this is kind of the first or is the first in a series uh, around culture that we are going to be introducing to you. And so uh, we will follow this uh, webinar. The next one in this series will be around the transgender community. And so uh, look forward to those date. it'll be, dates that will be posted on our website. The very next webinar that we will do as a system of care will be on social marketing. Potential date for that will be August 15th, and so um, keep your eyes out for that as well on the website. Uh, but today, I'm excited. Uh, we are going to be uh, starting the Word series, and today we're just talking about how to uh, engage uh, young people in the LBGTQ community and how to do that appropriately in a way that's beneficial. And so a um, couple of things we'd love for you to learn today as you walk from this or to walk away is to realize that there, all of us can learn something new. Um, hopefully you enjoyed the paddle boat experience. That was a new experience for me, but a chance for us to learn something new, uh, new about people, how to engage people in, in, in interpersonal relationships, um, and how to uh, appropriately and positively engage people. And then the other is sometimes we mess up. Sometimes we say the wrong word. Sometimes we're not sure what to do. Um, and sometimes we fall and get wet. And so uh, that's okay. Uh, we're going to try to help you figure out how to recover, how to get back on the board. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Shane. Our format today is going to be kind of conversational. Shane will um, give us lots of information, wonderful information, but there will be times where we're going to um, hold a conversation. If you have questions, burning questions, please uh, add those questions. We can't guarantee that we're going to get to all of those questions today, uh, but hopefully we'll have a format um, to answer those. Maybe they can inform future website, I mean webinars for us, um, or we can answer those on the website um, as this is posted. Just told they can't hear me. Is that any better? Can you hear me now? Are we good? All right. So do I need to do all of that all over again? Yes. Oh. Okay. So we're good. Sorry, guys. So there's some technical glitches, as you would expect when you mess with technology. So I think we're good. I'm going to pass it on over to Shane, and we'll get moving. Our camera kind of has limited space, so you may see us, you know, kind of swinging in and out of frame. So apologize <laughs> for that. Hopefully, you won't get seasick. So uh, my name is Shane Wally, and I am a licensed social worker. I got my master's in social work from the University of Texas at Austin, Hookham. Um, I have been giving workshops around LGBT identities um, and the ways that life uh, impacts those communities uh, for about 15 years. And uh, I'm really excited. This is the first time I've ever done it in a webinar format. So we'll see how everything goes. Go ahead. Um, so this is a little bit about what the agenda is going to be. Introductions, check, and done. Uh, <laughs> talking a little bit about LGBT youth uh, in the communities and the why of it. And hopefully, uh, if you've been on for a little bit, you've seen a lovely scrolling um, set of slides that will give you a little bit of the why. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. 
uh, I think one of the biggest things that stops people from having these communicate having conversations about this is that there's so much language and uh, it grows all the time. And so trying to sort out kind of what some of the vocabulary is and to break down some of the differences between uh, gender identity and sexual orientation. So we're going to spend some time on that. And then to talk a little bit about um, kind of what's next. So you have you know, some theory and you have some vocabulary and then how do you use that when you're engaging with young people? So that is, and then questions, so that's kind of where we are. Okay, so we're going to kind of give you a second to read as we go. I'm going to be quiet, I'm not going to read these aloud to you. <laughs> this is the information that was included in the scrolling before, and so uh, we leave it here so you can actually access, when you access the PowerPoint, you'll have an opportunity to have all of the information, but basically the information that was scrolling at the beginning of the web, webinar um, comes from this from this year. So the things I, I guess I would like to just point out a couple of things that you may have noticed as themes in the why, right? So um, LGBTQ youth are at a lot higher risk of uh, suicidal attempts and suicidal ideation. Um, 25 to 40 percent of all homeless youth are LGBTQ identified. Um, and that is often because people are, um, you know, either they come out and their families kick them out or they run away from home because they don't want to have to come out. Um, and uh, people's completion of high school or, or kind of the effects of bullying, like all, all of that is also a piece of it. So just like it's really important. I think we live in this time in, in the United States where we think it's so much better. And as somebody who came out 30 years ago, it's better and there's still so much work to do. So just that's the, the piece of the why for me. And I think too, Shane, we're going to hit a little bit on that um, the importance of when you, whether it's in a provider um, consumer relationship or somewhere else, to um, recognize that it, that relationship is for the benefit of the young person as opposed to me. So when, if I'm curious about something, right. um, the focus isn't on me, it's about right. how do I help that, that right. young person. Right. And, and that, you know, if they identify as a lesbian, gay in that arena, that doesn't have to be the focus of therapeutic session right or, unless it unless it is their most burning thing right exactly. so we, yeah. it really needs to be client driven in terms of um, whether people are looking support around their gender identity or se uh, sexual orientation or whether okay. you know they're they're looking to, yeah. to work on other things so with that you kind of bring up this so we think about gender and sexuality right. um, those oftentimes get interchanged, mm -hmm. uh, used interchangeably. Uh, can you help us identify? And actually, before we do that, we're going to have a polling question. But when we after that, can we actually tell us, help us understand maybe the difference sure. different between the two? So sure. we have a polling question that's going to come up. If you uh, will answer that for us, and then um, Shane will get into um, differentiating between sexuality and gender. So here we go. The polling question is, a 13-year-old is too young to know that they are gay, lesbian, or bisexual. True or false? These well-educated people. It's like, how long do we give them to be smart? <laughs> Remember the clock. I think we have a pretty easy, unanimous, 100 percent, everybody percent that is false. So, Great. thank you very much for for your, for uh, answering that, Shane. Uh, yeah. So. Um, I put together this continua uh, a long time ago, probably 20 years ago, as a way to kind of help make sense of some things that were going on in my life. So um, everybody has a birth certificate, most likely, whether you know where it is or not. <laughs> um, it's a really legal document. I think for a lot of people for whom how they identify in the world and what's on their um, birth certificate, if they line up, you know, your birth certificate isn't a thing, right? Um, and that that what's the sex or a biological sex or what some people uh, talk about as birth assigned gender is based on what the doctor finds uh, when you're born, right? So doctor looks and says, you know, oh, penis, male on the birth certificate, no penis, female on the birth certificate. And even that thing which we think of as kind of being the gold standard for um, our biology also isn't really 100%. So we have this whole umbrella group of medical uh, diagnoses that falls under the umbrella of intersex, and that could be that there are abnormalities, and I'm using that term because that's the medical term, uh, that can be about genitalia, it can be chromosomal, or it can be hormonal, and it could be diagnosed at birth, or it might not be diagnosed until later in someone's life, because if it's hormonal, it'll show up at adolescence. 
Yes. And if it's chromosomal, it, it may or may not ever be diagnosed. Yes. So um, there are over 250 intersex conditions. One in every 2,000 children is born with one. If you're interested in finding out more, the Intersex Society of North America is uh, a really good web starting spot to kind of get more information. Wonderful. Thank you. Then we, everybody has a gender identity. And your gender identity may match up with what's on your birth certificate, and it may not. And it may be um, male or female, male or female, or it could be anywhere along that continuum, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm somebody who identifies as gender queer. So my gender identity is neither male nor female. I'm somewhere in the center. Um, between the ages of three and five, little kids are kind of figuring out gender of everything, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're around a three to five year old, they're going to ask if things are a boy or a girl, yeah. dogs, squirrels, pets, siblings. Me, if you find me in a women's bathroom, right? <laughs> like, I'm pretty sure a three to five year old is really curious about why I'm there. Um, and so, and then between the ages of five and seven, little kids actually have a pretty good sense of who they are, especially in terms of what they want to wear, how they want to wear their hair, how they want to dress, who they want to play with, what they want to play with, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so that's kind of our internal sense of self. Mm -hmm. And the trick is whether I have the ability to. Um, talk about it and express it with the people around me and what's going to happen. Are they mm -hmm. going to say you're too young to know? Are they going to say you can't do that? Is that not true? Or are they going to say, well, I'm really curious about that. What, what do you want? Mm -hmm. Like, what do you want to look like? How would you like to dress? Is there something else you want to be called? Mm -hmm. um, there's been a viral video that's been going around about Ryland, yeah. and you can Google it and find out more, and it really tells the story of how parents are doing that well. Um, so gender identity um, is, um, is kind of an internal sense of self. Let's go ahead and go to the – oh, here we go. Yeah, we have a question. But I have some, so I would think, obviously, if you think about the environmental things that are present at that age, right. and so if, if a young person is not feeling kind of with Ryland, not right. feeling or in, internally not feeling what they their birth uh, biology was. That's, mm -hmm. kind of, that's a whole other level of confusion and headache and turmoil, I would think, because it's like, I don't feel this way, but this is, cause looking at Rylan's story, you talked about, they talked about how born female, right. uh, but not feeling like it, constantly right. identifying the boy. So, right. and if the world is telling me that that's who you are, you are a right. female, but that's not what I feel. That's a whole right. other level. And I, I think it'd be hard for a, Obviously, we don't have to go through the psychodynamic dynamic right. aspects of it, but um, that would be a really difficult place for a five or six-year-old child, right. more or less someone that the right. teenagers were right. working with them. So, uh, I mean, I just want to clarify maybe one word in that sentence, mm -hmm. right? And I heard you say confusing, right? And I just want to kind of clarify what, what is confusing, if that mm -hmm. makes sense, right? So the child is not confused, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. The child is really clear mm -hmm. about what's going on for them. Mm -hmm. It can be confusing for them because what they feel really solid in isn't being Matched accepted, right? Because yeah, exactly. I think we often talk that. about young people being confused. Mm -hmm. They're not confused. Mm -hmm. Society is confused about them, mm -hmm. which causes crisis. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, really thank you. Clear. That's great clarification. Um, so the question is, are intersex people typically or always transgender? Or are they trans transgender if they are assigned one gender and identify as a different later? Yeah, that's um. I, I think inter like where intersex um, folks and transgender um, it's complicated, right? <laughs> so, uh, so we have you here today. Sorry. So I will see if I can make it even more complicated. Um, so some uh, people who um, are intersex or have a, an intersex condition also identify as transgender. Some do not. Mm -hmm. Some people end up having um, some type of medical intervention that looks a lot that looks like transition, mm -hmm. although it isn't kind of the same as transsexual, um, because we often think about intersex conditions as terms of medical conditions, and mm -hmm. we still are in this place where we think of transgender identity around um, uh, psychology, mm -hmm. right? And so, some people who identify as intersex identify under the transgender umbrella. Some mm -hmm. people who identify as intersex don't. And mm -hmm. so, um, and some people who are intersex never have any kind of metal, uh, medical okay. intervention, and some people do. Okay. So it, you kind of have to, if you know that someone's intersex, and you know them well enough to have an awkward conversation, yeah. you kind of get to find out. But there's no, 
Um, I, I'm not going to say kind of yes or no to that yeah. question. It's really okay. individual. Yeah, really individual. Cool. Yeah. And just remind everyone, that, and I know there's a number of questions coming in about um, transgender and that just in the conversation you're saying you and I've had that by itself could be on the webinar. Guess yeah, what? Right. Uh, it's going to be. Yeah. <laughs> so that's our right. next one. So if you're putting those in and we don't get to all of those, uh, realize that we recognize that's a whole nother um, discussion and discussion that would not fit into this hour and a half. And we're going to try to get what we can even in this hour and a half. So if we don't answer all of those, please know that we will get to those. Um, and if it's burning, uh, go ahead and list it and we will do our best to try to get to you um, through that. So uh, let's keep we're moving. Gonna, yeah, we're going to keep it going on. So gender expression is how do I show myself to the world, right? How do I wear my hair? What do I wear for clothes? And do I wear makeup or not makeup? Nail polish, not makeup. Nail polish, not nail polish. <laughs> nail polish is makeup. It's painful. Um, so, <laughs> um, so those are the kind of the markers of how we're read, right? And the, the thing that's really important, especially for people who are working with um, young people is it often is not safe for them to express their gender identity. So you cannot, just to make clear that not is the, word, the thing that you hear, uh, you are not always able to tell people's gender identity based on their gender expression, expression. because they may or may not have safety, they may or may not have access, mm -hmm. right? Like if I'm a young person and I don't have money and my parents are only gonna let me buy the clothes that they think I should be wearing, and they aren't going to allow me to wear the clothes that I feel the most comfortable in, mm -hmm. you won't know that unless I'm able to tell you. Exactly. And I think the other thing is if we're working with minors and often that we're working with family systems, that young person may never be able to tell us because we, never, never, we may not get access to them without Alone. their family around. Yeah. Okay. So. Oh, thank you. There we go. So those first three things are all about who I am, right? And so if we think about LGBT, those three things are more in the T category if what's on the birth certificate does not match, right, what the gender identity is. Mm -hmm. This last part is about who am I interested in, right? So this is about the LGB part. Mm -hmm. um, and the Q is kind of a hybrid bridge, and that gets super complicated. And we'll talk about that more when we get to language. Um, but sexual orientation is, am I attracted to um, male-identified people, female-identified people, uh, people who identify within that spectrum, or am I interested in people all across the spectrum? Mm -hmm. Now, just because I'm identify, I might be interested in people all across the spectrum, it still doesn't mean I'm attracted to everyone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How distracting would yeah, that be? Like, open my front door, no, no, can't, no, nope, can't go out today, and then close the door. Um, but it means that I have the ability to find all types of identities and bodies um, attractive and interesting, mm -hmm. and that I, I want to might want to be romantically involved. Okay. All right. So we have yet another uh, polling question, uh, and then we'll answer a couple more questions. Do, 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 do. <laughs> Maybe polling question is coming. There, there we, we go. go. So a person's gender identity influences their sexual orientation. You just got the answer to that one. So if you fell, uh, you're going to no be in trouble. No, sh no shame. <laughs> no, no shaming. shaming. Oh, sorry. Yeah. They didn't actually get the answer. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't get that answer to that. So. All right. So we see 80% somebody wavering. Probably because Michael just completely confused them. All right. Good, good. I think we probably have a, a good, good number. So the deal is that our the sexual orientation and gender identity are not connected. So a trans person can be gay or straight. Um, a cisgender person. So if what's on your birth certificate and um, how you identify the definition of cisgender can be gay, straight, or bi. That they are. All of us have both identities. We both have a gender, we all, actually all of us operate on all four things, right? So everything, all of us have what's on our birth certificate. We all have a gender identity, whether we are conscious of it or not, mm -hmm. right? Um, we all make decisions every day about how we're going to express our gender. And we may not think again about that that way. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and then we all have a sexual orientation and they are not, they are not connected. Mm -hmm. 
So in our relationship and getting to, get, getting to know you, I've, I've learned and continue to learn <laughs> quite a bit as far as terminology, language to use, language not to use. Mm -hmm. um, so what happens is so we've looked at the, the continua and moving on maybe a little bit more to actual terminology. Mm -hmm. How do we reach that conversation if I've said a term that is offensive mm -hmm. or if I use a term that is inappropriate? How do we recover that? conversation, how do I maybe approach you and say, right, that was not right? I mean, I, yeah. <laughs> um, I am somebody who uses humor, so I try to lovingly, uh, you know, throw a softball kind of jokey lob, um, or I may just be direct, right? So I had a conversation with somebody not too long ago, and they asked me something about my lifestyle. Um, and it, go ahead and go to the next slide, because it's actually on that slide. Um, so the next couple of slides are kind of the terminology breakdown between uh, kind of old school clinical, and when I say clinical, I mean more like medical research terminology, and again, you'll see that it is to be avoided, right? So lifestyle is to be avoided because most heterosexual people don't think about their heterosexuality as a mm -hmm. lifestyle. That heterosexual lifestyle, how's that going for you? <laughs> Why'd you choose it? <laughs> like, yeah. wrong. Yeah. Um, so sometimes I'll flip a question back. Sometimes I will just say, you know, I don't know if you're aware, but sometimes that doesn't feel very good or sound very mm -hmm. good, and this is why. Yeah. And I, one of the things that I talk a lot about is the difference between intent and impact. So if I know you well enough, I know that your intention was great. Mm -hmm. Like, you want to get to know me better, and that's cool. The impact is like, really, again, yeah. somebody said that to me, like, oh. So the question is, how do we kind of stay in that pool between intent and impact in a way that I'm not having to take care of you, exactly. right? Yeah. Like, you've just hurt my feelings, but I'm going to take care of you, yeah. maybe or maybe not. Yeah. And I also don't want to create a negative impact on you. Like, I don't want to have an impact yeah. war, yeah. right? Exactly. So it's like trying to, to um, understand best intention and mm -hmm. still have a meaningful conversation. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's good. That yeah, they're definitely, definitely good. So, Andy, specifically looking on here, um, honestly, the, the first one you think of homosexual, uh, to be avoided. And that, that would be one that I think many in mainstream America right. would wonder what's, 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 the, what's the deal? Problem? What's the deal? Why would that be avoided? So, can you kind of make it sound sure. a little bit why? So, I think for me, and again, you know, like, um, <laughs> I often get in the position to speak for my people, and I, I want to say that I have, you know, I have worked in community for a long time, and so I, I feel like I have a pretty good sampling of this conversation, and mm -hmm. you might meet somebody who's like, please call me a homosexual, and I'm going to be like, oh, all right. Yeah. Like, one of the cardinal rules for me about language is that it's not okay to tell somebody not to call themselves something, mm -hmm. and I also think it's this great thing to gently, um, so if I say, uh, I'll hold that, okay, so homosexual. Um, it was coined in the 1860s as a way to research behavior. So it comes from a researchy clinical background. Mm -hmm. First strike. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Second strike is homosexual and homosexuality what was, is what was considered a mental disorder and was in the DSM until 1973, okay. right? So mm -hmm. within my lifetime. Mm -hmm. um, strike two. <laughs> and then if you're going to talk about things in a religious context and we're going to talk about something that is an abomination, mm -hmm. it's usually homosexuals and homosexuality that is an abomination. Mm -hmm. So there's not usually a lot of positive context yeah. that is used around the yeah. term. So um, so I, I don't know a lot of people who wake up in the morning and are like, oh, I'm a happy homosexual going out into the world today. <laughs> right? That it's used or I woke up and said, this morning, I'm happy heterosexual. <laughs> right, right. right. So it it's like, and the other thing is it really puts the emphasis on the sex part, yeah, yeah, which isn't usually as big a part of my life as anybody right. might think. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Well, good. So I think the and the other end of that is is you made a point about um, the importance of how that person identifies, and so right. it's not an assumption on my part. Um, it's just being able to ask. And so right. if we're at that place, if I've said the wrong term, or I can tell that it made you uncomfortable, right. we quite go there. Is that's where that falling <laughs> and right. the water and getting back right. up to be able yeah. to say, man, I can see that that. They didn't, didn't quite settle well. Right, right. So how, how do you identify? Right. How would you like them right, to? Right. Um, so right. be able to have that. Yeah. Cool. So this is safer language. Um, this is language that you can use and usually not get in trouble about. <laughs> um, so 
Uh, again, we've talked about intersex, the gay, lesbian, bisexual kind of safer, uh, sexual orientation, cross-dresser, and cross-dresser would be instead of transvestite. So transvestite is not, not good. Um, and then transgender uh, kind of umbrella term around people who's, you know, what's on birth certificate and gender identity uh, don't match up. Okay. May you have to help us, Tori. So because LGBTQ is so diverse in how we self-identify, have we created a culture temperamentally, temper, temperamentality, with the greater community? You know, I think the language and how much language is growing all the time um, is, a, is really a mixed blessing. Yeah. So um, I think there's amazing power in being able to find terminology that resonates with me, mm -hmm. right? Like, so when I first came out around being gender nonconforming, uh, that term wasn't really a thing. Gender queer didn't evolve. So I used to talk about living in the gender gray. Mm -hmm. oh, awkward. Um, <laughs> is that a light gray? Is that gunmetal gray? What kind of gray? So the, when, the word gray. Gen, right, when the word <laughs> gender queer came up, I was like, ooh, a term, mm -hmm. right? So I think the, the power in self-naming is great. In terms of organizing and in terms of education, it gets really hard, yeah. right? And I think I also hear some like, well, you're just making it confusing. And it's like, so what? Mm -hmm. Right? Like people make up language all the time. Um, and people, uh, and yet if it's what is honoring and respectful, then I need to learn it and understand it and use it well. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, in some ways I really think the more is the better. And I get the piece of like, and I have a feeling there's really more language about straight identity than we are conscious of, yeah, right? Yeah. Because it's it's just so normalized, mm -hmm. right? And yet around LGBT Q stuff, it's like, oh, something new. Yeah, yeah. So and then you thing. made that great point. I think we were talking about this the other day about how there are new, there's new terminology that creeps up all the time. LOL. Right, you know, right, there's right. there's always new terminology. And yeah, so, I mean, somebody just uh, I was messaging with somebody and they were like BRB. And I was like, I don't know what that means. <laughs> They're like, I'll be right back. I'm like, thanks that, you know, thank yeah. you to the elder. Yeah. <laughs> the elder thanks you for clearing that up. Yeah, so yeah. it's evolving all the time. Yeah, and so that, and then it brings it back. So in, in that process of a provider or someone working with young people, um, if there's that place of um, help with identity and what does that look like, if that is their role, great, we can have that conversation. Right. But it doesn't have to be the focus. Right, right. And we really need to be cautious that we're not asking our our clients or the people we're working with to train us, like the information's available. Yeah. My email address will be at the end of the <laughs> webinar. And there's this thing called the internet. And you know, like it's all out there. Yeah. And I will say that one of the things about working with young people, especially if they are tum on Tumblr, like it is the world is changing on Tumblr. While we're here, this yes. language will be changed in the hour and a half that we've been sitting here. <laughs> and so um, get a Tumblr account, you know, yeah. like get, Stay on social media, even if it's uncomfortable and you're not quite sure what it all is. Um, we can have access to all of this information then, and not being getting it from the people we yeah. serve. And it's also really important that if you don't have LGBTQ people in your life, um, that that is important because yeah. then you get to have better dialogue. Mm -hmm. And the uh, downside maybe to that is when we come out, we don't get a manual, <laughs> right? So uh, sometimes. I have friends who are gay and lesbian who um, it isn't central to their life, that they are not political people, mm -hmm. that they may not know mm -hmm. everything. Like it's taken me yeah. a, a long time to accumulate all the knowledge mm -hmm. that I have. Mm -hmm. So, and, and politically, a lot of people will feel really differently about some yeah. things. Yeah. So I'm going to reiterate this, what's specifically what you said about if you're in that position of provider or working with a young person, um, the importance of going to maybe an expert or contacting right. someone else and not necessarily being your opportunity to explore. Right. Um, because right. then it becomes more about you right. than it does the right. person. And so right. if you want education, if you want some more awareness, go to right. the experts or right. the, the places right. to get that, cool. that information. Okay, so this is what, okay, so I named this hipster language before hipster became a huge thing. So I may have to recall something else. Um, just saying. So <laughs> this is kind of the language that's newer. Um, and actually, this language isn't all that new now. But I think for a lot of people, especially if they're not in the community, it's a newer language. So I'm going to break some of this down a little bit more. So genderqueer is somebody who doesn't, who kind of lives outside the gender binary or may have a lot of fluidity around their gender expression. Disorders of sexual development 
is now kind of the newer language that's being used around intersex. So they're synonymous. Queer is just the most complicated word, which makes it delightful in my life, right? So, you know, for folks who may be more of my generation who are on the webinar, um, you may be like, oh my God, that's a bad term and I would never use it. And how dare you put it on a, you know, put it on a sheet. <laughs> um, and the, the truth is, yes, that was true. Starting in the 80s, so the, rec the reclamation of the word queer has been going on for a long time now. So in the 80s, when HIV and AIDS was um, devastating the community, uh, there was a, a um, political group called uh, Queer Nation. And they, so in the 80s, the word queer was this really political term, and you knew if somebody used it that they were probably in the fight, mm -hmm. right? Um, now what I find is that I often talk about queer as the anti-label. Because if I identify as queer, you don't know much about me. I could identify as um, gay or lesbian. I could identify as bisexual or pansexual. I, I, I could use that term because of my politics. So if I know somebody who self-identifies as queer at some point, again, not the first thing, like identify as queer and you don't say, why do you do that? <laughs> like, don't do that. Um, but if I know them for a while, I might be like, wow, I, I heard you identify as queer. I'm curious what that means to you. Mm -hmm. And there's usually a great story, yeah, right? Yeah. So it's really a good bridge mm -hmm. kind of question. Okay. Um, if, so I have some ground rules about the word queer. If it's how somebody self-identifies, it's really the right thing to you do, right, to use it. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to be respectful of me and my sexual orientation comes up in a conversation, which might be random, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> using the word queer is appropriate. Okay. Uh, two is it should never be yelled out of a car window. Really, nothing should ever be yelled yeah, out of yeah. a car window. Um, <laughs> Good idea. And the third thing is, I would never, that would never be the first question I would ask someone. Mm -hmm. So if I was in a place where I was going to ask somebody about their sexual orientation, which is iffy anyway, yeah, right? Yeah. But I would never say, are you queer? Like, I wouldn't be the leading yeah. question, because mm -hmm. even within the gay and lesbian community, you know, kind of not everybody's on board. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Cisgender, I've talked a little bit about. So what, if what's on your birth certificate and what your gender identity are line up, um, cisgender might be a new term for you. And then some people are moving to sexual identity um, instead of using sexual orientation. So okay. all the language. You said cisgender? Yeah, and I said cisgender. Okay. Okay. Yep. All right. Here we go. I was trying to read across at the same time. Hmm. Negative slang. Negative slang. So this is language to be avoided unless it's how somebody self identifies. I'm not going to go through and give these words. You can just kind of read the list and be like, yep, nope, 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 nope. Um, cool. I, so like even one point that you, this was prior to our, in a prior conversation, was um, really it's the question sometimes to come up, well, how do I know or who knows what term to use? Oh, right. And you made the mention of the community defines. Okay? Right. Obviously right. it's the person, right. but within the community, those definitions are awesome. Right. Well, I think, you know, there's a big, um, if anybody follows social media, there's a huge um, conversation afoot about the word tranny um, because it's, it's getting used on RuPaul's Drag Race right yeah, now. Yeah. And there's been a lot of like, who can say it and who can't say it and what's the history and blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. And my feeling is if, the, if, if a lot of members of the transgender community are saying we don't like it and it's derogatory, then people need to take that seriously yeah. and be quiet, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. So um, I think you know. So I, I think the community and that some of the words do get used uh, lovingly within the community as a kind of reclamation point, mm -hmm. and even that gets a little tricky because what I might be reclaiming might be triggering to somebody else, yeah. right? And so. If somebody, if I'm in a room and somebody's like, "Please don't use that term," mm -hmm. I find it offensive. Yeah, I'm not going to use it. So this is, and we've talked about this a little bit too. That, that it, it's it amazes me, obviously, with, within this community, why we as a society has made it so faux pas. But in in our regular interactions, um, I would hope that when you're curious about anybody, right, <laughs> that you right. just would, you know, in a positive respectful way, get to know someone, right. Um, and I'm, I've always been curious why. It has to be so icky right. or weird or whatever it may be when trying to bridge the gap. I think it started in a grocery cart when we were three years old. And we pointed and hollered, mm -hmm. usually something not well right. said. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, yeah. why is that person, insert problematic sentence here, mm -hmm. right? 
And that what happens to most people when that happens, when they, we do that, is they're like, shh, they don't say that. Mm -hmm. And the grocery cart yeah. is quickly on the other side of the grocery store, right? Yeah. So our initial curiosity about people who are different from us was shamed out of us mm -hmm. really, really, really early. Yeah. And then no one retooled us on how to do that better, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So I'm a big proponent that if you have a child in a grocery cart who says something problematic, or if you have a little child who meets me in a bathroom and is mm -hmm. like, are you a boy or a girl, that instead of like shushing them and moving them, mm -hmm. that, and again, this is mine, yeah, like yeah. people may disagree with me, yeah. but my thing is to say first to the child, mm -hmm. wow, it seems like you're really curious. Curiosity is not a bad thing, but mm -hmm. we may need to think about how we ask. Mm -hmm. Then I might turn to the person and say, you may have noticed my child is curious about you. Mm -hmm. Are you uh, in a place where we could ask some questions? Mm -hmm. Like, get, I'm a huge believer in asking permission to ask questions and not just assume that you can be all up in my face, yeah. right? Yeah. And then to help the child, like, reframe the question better, mm -hmm. right? So if we taught little kids how to be, a pro like I talk about respectful curiosity, yeah. right? Like how do we be respectfully curious about each other? Um, and we taught that skill young, then we would have such better conversations yeah. as adults, <laughs> yeah. right? Instead of kind of being ter terrified. Yeah. Yeah. And I do think because of systemic um, oppression, right? Mm -hmm. Because of racism and sexism and homophobia and the fact that we often are quick to call somebody it's, it's, right. Yeah, yeah. That then we're also really terrified. Mm -hmm. um, so again, if if we are building, if it's about building solid relationships with people, and I know you well enough that we can sustain trouble, mm -hmm. then I think as those relationships deepen, the level of conversations deepen. Yeah. I think the other thing is it's really hard to listen to people's pain. Right. Like yeah. if I'm telling uh -huh. a really hard conversation about being locked out of a bathroom. Um, and what that meant for me in the in the up toward the panhandle of Texas, right? <laughs> um, you you may be like, oh God, that's too much, or I don't know what to say, or mm -hmm. what what's going to happen. Um, but I think the more you can say, wow, God, what happened? Like yeah. that sounds awful. Yeah, yeah. Then I'm more willing to engage yeah, with exactly. you, right? Yeah. So I think all of those things help. Okay, good. So we have another question um, from participants that says, Do you believe the LGBTQ community? has had to justify our psychosexual makeup to gain social acceptance? You all ask heady questions. <laughs> um, just saying. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I think I've had to uh, explain myself all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Like, people want to know if I was born this way or if I chose it, and thank God for Lady Gaga for answering the question. Um, Obviously, but well, anyway, no. Um, <laughs> or the fact that, you know, um, I don't know if people know that it's a random story maybe, but um, the story for how it got out of the DSM is that, you know, the DSM is uh, uh, kept by the American Psych uh, Psych uh, Psychiatric okay. Association, right? And so in order to get it taken out, somebody had to stand on the floor of the association and make the case, right? Mm -hmm. In 1973, it was so terrifying to do that that the psychiatrist who they finally got to agree to make the argument did it with a paper bag over his head. Oh, he wow. did it anonymously. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. So it's oh, like, true. Um, and so I think, you know, kind of having to prove that, you know, there's nothing wrong with me. Yeah. <laughs> or, you know, we're in this moment of time, which I have mixed emotions about, of kind of fighting for rights on an assimilationist model, mm -hmm. like love is love and I'm just like you. And it's like, I'm not just like you, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, although we have similar hair. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Um, Same barber. <laughs> possibly. <laughs> um, that, um, so, you know, it's, it's really mixed. But I, I do think I'm, I'm often, and I, I have a lot of friends who feel like they're put in that situation of having to kind of prove their worth yeah, yeah. in a way that shouldn't have to happen. Yeah, yeah. And that one, so you kind of hit on a little bit too that, 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 of, fear of something's wrong with you. But I wonder, too, if that's, um, again, coming back to uh, sometimes we make it about ourselves. Right. If I'm uncomfortable or maybe there's something wrong with me that I don't want, it's easier to put that on back on you. Right. And so let's make right. that more focused there. Right. So, right. Um, right. And I can see that very damaging to anyone. Right. But working with young people specifically, that becomes a... Right. I mean, if... 
if the only conversations that we're ever having with young people or around young people are conversations about heterosexuality, and that is who I know, like that doesn't resonate with me, mm -hmm. you know, when we have that awkward talk with adolescents, um, you know, kind of the, uh, you know, your, your hormones are kicking in and yeah. you might be noticing mm -hmm. that usually we just, that, that conversation is an opposite sex thing, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're talking to a girl, you're like, you're going to meet some nice young man and you're going to fall in love and you're going to get married and have babies, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> right? Um, instead of saying your hormones are cooking in and I just hope you find love and whoever you love and excites you and you find interesting, you know, I hope that you're safe and I hope you'll bring them by the house and we'll get to meet them. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and, and I, we hope it's joyous for you. Yeah. You know, and we're, I, I think most parents are still not having that conversation. Yeah. yeah. And again, like you said earlier, then that was actually even within this time, kind of an aha for me was it's again, not a confusion of that young person. No, a young it's, person knows. It's the confusion of the parent and, and, or the discomfort or the whatever of the parent. And so right. it's, it, it's that, right. So you right. put that young person right. almost in a very tough situation, as you mentioned earlier, there were those rates go up because now you've communicated as parents or as providers or whoever it is right. that the way that you feel and right. want to identify is wrong. Right. And so there's that whole reciprocal thing that begins right. to you happen. You have to, you, you know, sh you know, shame is probably the biggest toxin in our society. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so if, if what we're doing is um, either um, covertly or overtly shaming young people around what they know to be their truth, mm -hmm. The other thing is living, um, keeping, holding secrets, especially like, you know, I, I just, um, I did a leadership seminar where we talked about kind of what our personal core values are, right? Mm -hmm. And one of my personal core values is authenticity. Mm -hmm. And in order for me to be authentic, I have to be out. But in order for me to be out, I put myself at risk, yeah. right? Yeah. So um, for young people, if they know that their parents are not accepting and that they might be homeless, it's like, okay authenticity over safety yeah. Yeah. yeah you know and so so i think people yeah. are having to kind of juggle a lot yeah. in terms of what a kind of um a loss gain scenario yeah. all all the time and yeah. i think the other thing is we talk about the coming out process like we i'm out check it off the list and forward <laughs> i go and you know i make decisions every single moment of every single day mm -hmm. when i meet a new person about you know um, I I don't know how often I ever get read as straight. So I think <laughs> my, I walk into a room and maybe assumptions are made about that, mm -hmm. right? Um, but like in terms of thinking about, am I going to tell people what my pronouns are? And that's the <laughs> last one. Um, right, so whether I'm going to talk about my pronouns or whether I'm going to talk about my gender identity or whether I'm going to talk about um, how it impacts me, mm -hmm. right? Like I'm having to make this. Am I gonna? Am I gonna make myself small to make other people comfortable? Yeah. Or am I gonna, you know, kind of bring it? Yeah. Um, yeah. And and what's gonna happen? Yeah. I'm, like all the time, I'm negotiating. Exactly. That. Yeah. And and that whole component of safety again, right. you have to you're constantly yeah. gauging whether it's safe or not. So right. here's just some examples of of some of that terminology as far as right. Language. So thinking about you know not being afraid to ask people what language they use. And again, to be mindful that we still are not in a place where we can just, I often get asked, like, I have a friend who I think is gay, you know, what do I do, right? And, um, and the truth is, what you have to do is prove that you are a safe enough person so they will come out to you, mm -hmm. right? You can't, we're still in a place where people lose too much if you ask them point blank and they come out. Mm -hmm. But you can say things like, are you in a relationship? Or who are you dating? Or who do you find attractive without saying, oh, do you have a girlfriend? Mm -hmm. What's well, like, well, crap, you've just boxed me in, yeah. right? Yeah. Instead of like, are you seeing anyone? And you're like, oh, wow, nice open question. Like, I can walk through that door, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and then once people are out, then you can say, one, listen to what language people use. Like, I usually talk about myself with the language that I want to have used about mm -hmm. me, right? So to listen, again, you can ask for gentle clarifying um, to mirror the language that people, you know, mirror the language that yeah, people yeah, use. Yeah, it's the same. It's kind same of thing, thing, yeah. Uh, oh, just, like, confidentiality, especially with young people, mm -hmm. is so important. And social media is the bane of existence because 
um, we've had people accidentally outed because somebody will go on their wall and say, hey, it was great to see you down on 4th Street last night. Yeah. Want, want, yeah. you know, yeah. right? And then yeah. the parents are like, "What's Fourth Street? Mm -hmm. Oh my God, that's all the gay bars are." Ooh. You yeah. know, so um, I often talk about the circles of outness. Mm -hmm. So if you came out to me, I might be like, "Oh, cool. Are you out to your family? Mm -hmm. People at school know that mm -hmm. I'm going to kind of do a, a map of mm -hmm. kind of how out you are, and to yeah. make sure that I'm not going to jam you up, yeah. right? And if you're a service provider." Uh, you don't tell anyone. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's not necessary. Not necessary. And, I, and I think that that's what's what I love about this. While we're having this conversation, is that um, I really hope that we get to that place um, and with participants in those things, just to realize that it, it doesn't have to be that taboo. You know, I, I'm if I'm in a relationship with getting to know somebody, was therapeutic or not, I'm curious about them as a person. Right, right. Um, it's it's amazing again how it doesn't have to come to what my sexuality is unless that right. person brings that to the table. Right. You know, it's just right. simply getting to know someone. Right. And you made it very clear. This is that education for me is being able to listen right. and use utilize terminology, pronouns, whatever it may be that you specifically identify for. And you made a really good point of um, I'll help you for a little while. Right. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> at right. some point. At some point I cut you loose yeah. and I give you the stink eye. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So Okay, so pronouns. the pronouns, right? So I lovingly refer to this as the chart. Um, so my pronouns are the ones on the far left. So I use the here and here's. Um, they're not new. I mean, they're new in the evolution of all language, but I learned them about 20 years ago. I've been actively using them um, in my life for the about seven. Um, we don't actually usually ask people their pronouns, right? For mm -hmm. cisgender people, it's really interesting, actually, because if I'm in a room when we're doing introductions, I'll say, please give your name and tell us what pronouns you use and what's your title at work and blah, blah, blah. And people will be like, I'm Mary and I use... What's the pronoun? <laughs> right, 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 right. Is she and, uh, you know, her. Yeah. And uh, cisgender people work on your pronouns. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> um, you know, and so... Uh, so it's Z instead of he and she, here instead of him and her, and here's instead of his and hers. And I use those because I don't identify in the binary. So that really strict binary language, you know, kind of doesn't make mm -hmm. a lot of sense. I will say that I think Z here and here's are not going to win the gender neutral pronoun race. I think <laughs> that uh, they, them, and their are going to win the race. Yeah. Um, and I know for people who are grammar people, you're like, those are plural and you can't use them as singular. And I'm going to lovingly let you know that you can, the world will not end, and that it's actually easier because you already know how to and where to insert that language. Mm -hmm. um, and I know people who use their first initial as their pronoun. I know people who ask people never to use a pronoun and just use their first name. Um, and if you're like, I feel really uncomfortable asking people their pronouns. I get it. It mm -hmm. is new. It's yeah. new. So um, try to avoid pronouns. Try to use the person's name. I wish we lived in a world where when we introduced ourselves to each other, we would just give our pronouns as part of it. So when you and I met, I would just say, hi, I'm Shane, I use he and here, and you would have said, I'm Michael, I use he and him, and we would be done and we could move on, mm -hmm. right? And then it would just be like breathing that that yeah, was yeah. part of the conversation. Yeah. That's Shane's brave new world. I don't, think we're, <laughs> I don't think we're there yet. But I think the way, and even in, again, in our relationship, how it's uh, happened, I think we, I think I actually emailed you right. and asked, and you were like, it's in my bio. Right. Like, oh, but so that makes you awareness of the message is the person is probably telling you. Right. Um, and it's also, like I said, in your right. bio, it's very clear. Right. And, and to help me to be more uh, conscientious about right. information that's there. And, yeah. Yeah. That's and, right. and being able to make that the right. next step and know that's okay. And the other thing is pronouns also often out people. Mm -hmm. And so I also know people who, um, may not want to be asked because mm -hmm. they're not ready to, to tell you, mm -hmm. right? And so then it gets tricky. And I would say that, um, you know, to kind of take it out maybe to a social justice context, if we think about where we have privilege, right? So we can talk about white privilege and male privilege um, and straight privilege. Mm -hmm. And now we have this thing that we talk about, cisgender privilege, right? Things that people often don't have to navigate that trans or gender nonconforming people have to navigate all the time. Mm -hmm. And so if, if you're a cisgender person and you ask somebody their pronouns and they push back on you, mm -hmm. like, it's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, like, you get to take care of yourself in that yeah. because um, for the people who ask me, take the risk to ask me and I have the chance to tell them, that's so helpful. Mm -hmm. um, 
So again, it's about being willing to make mistakes and know that you're going to lead that one instance and, and life is going to be easy for you. Yeah. But for that gender nonconforming person, they're going to leave you and have to navigate their pronouns with a thousand other people. Right? <laughs> yeah, and yeah. So, you know, five seconds of discomfort for you is going to add a, a huge amount of help mm -hmm. for the person you're willing to yeah. engage with. Yeah. So this is kind of, this is catching you on the fly. So no, it's okay. yeah. That's all right. um, bring it. So if you, <laughs> if, if you could give looking through knowing the audience, maybe providers, I really don't know the demographic of everyone that's on right. the webinar, but um, when it comes to working with young people right. and, and um, someone genuinely wanting to, help whatever that may look like right. and this becomes this is surfaced by the young person curiosity right. what would be your advice to that provider that person helping the young person and what to do so if I'm working with a young person they say um, it just happens to come to the table that uh, they identify as trans right um, what do we do with that I think um, I think you find out how out they are right like are they just telling you, right? And then to find out what it would mean, like what are their hopes and fears for other people knowing. Mm -hmm. I think then there's also this kind of what are your hopes for what that looks like for you? Mm -hmm. And that does not, the first question shouldn't be, oh, are you going to transition? Mm -hmm. But like a much broader question of what does that mean? What does that mean to you, yeah, yeah. right? And they might say, you know, I've been fighting with my family to cut or grow my hair. Like here's the deal, right? <laughs> um, and they just won't do it. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, every time we go clothing shopping, it's a fight. Mm -hmm. Because usually if you're working with, you know, kind of under 18 year olds, mm -hmm. they know that medical transition is really not even a, an option for them, yeah, right? Yeah. So it's really about, or they might say, you know, in my school, every time I go in the women's bathroom, if it's a more masculine presenting person, like, mm -hmm. it's a fight, mm -hmm. right? I think the other thing about bathrooms is just, so important that people don't have to think about it, they don't have to navigate bathrooms, mm -hmm. right? Is if you're somebody who is hassled in bathrooms, you are going to try to go to bathrooms less. Mm -hmm. The way to go to bathrooms less is to not drink liquid. <laughs> yeah. True. Yeah. If you are not drinking liquid and you live in Austin, Texas, or anywhere where it's hot, if you're from Seattle, maybe not as big a problem. Um, but <laughs> if you're from a hot place, that means that those people are usually low-grade uh, dehydrated all the time. Mm -hmm. And low-grade dehydration makes you feel uh, tired, mm -hmm. often a little headachey, mm -hmm. a little achy. And you don't notice it because it's your constant state, uh -huh. right? Until, this is true in my life, until somebody said, they heard me complain about it all the time. They're like, how much water are you drinking? I'm like, I don't drink water because I don't like to go to the bathroom. And they're like, well... <laughs> This is a problem for exactly. you, yeah. right? Yeah. So, um, so it's like, so it's really about safety. Questions about safety, safety. first, mm -hmm. right? Like yeah. it's our code, safety yeah. first, and then to find out about kind of hopes and dreams, mm -hmm. and then to figure out if there is an actual plan to get safety in place, mm -hmm. and then to work toward hopes and dreams. Yeah, yeah. I would say that if you haven't worked with trans folks much, that gender identity is really a specialization and that you may need to refer them yeah. out, right? Yeah. Um, and that that needs to not sound like, I don't know what the passing hell to do on. with you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm passing on <laughs> I'm somebody. passing you on, right? Yeah. But like, I really want you to have the best care possible mm -hmm. or I really need, want you to be able to have what you need. Mm -hmm. Let's see if we can find somebody. Yeah. Now, if you live in a place where there isn't a trans expert, which is a lot of smaller places, yeah. right? When I first came out, fortunately, I was working with an amazing therapist. But when I said, hey, I think gender's a thing for me, mm -hmm. she's like, well, I've never worked with anybody that gender's a thing for. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what do you want to do? <laughs> and I said, let's learn together. Yeah. And so I would read a book and pass it to her, and she would read a book and pass it to me. <laughs> and this was when the internet was new, so the resources weren't yeah. there. Yeah. Um, and she she just stayed in process with me, which mm -hmm. actually was really healing. Yeah. So you can do the work, yeah. um, but if you live in a bigger place where there might be people who have the knowledge, mm -hmm. or you might need a care team to tag, yeah. tag team with a couple yeah. of people, yeah. right? But yeah. consult, 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 oh. consult. Good. Yeah. Well, thank you. You took that, you took that bait um, right. <laughs> <laughs> with that one. And, and I think yeah. the, the, for me, the key thing that's, that stands out is, one, the therapists who are working with you use your language. So repeated, right. gender's an issue for me. Right. Okay, I hear the genius and issues, right, or what do I do? Right, right, you know, right. as opposed to my assumptions of, well, now you're going to go down this road. Or right, it's just right. simply being able to be at that place where you Neutral. are. Neutral. 
neutral with where you right. are. Neutral with a, a strong dose of positivity. Yeah. I don't mean neutral, like all neutral, <laughs> exactly. like, right? Yeah. I think the other, and that would be um, something that I often talk about is when people come out to you, whether that's around sexual orientation or gender identity, and again, this is a basic clinical thing, but I think around coming out, I've seen some really wonky things happen. Mm -hmm. It's really important to mirror the affect, right? So if somebody comes out to me and says, oh my God, I think I might be gay, mm -hmm. and you think that being gay is the best thing in the world, you still can't be like rainbow cannon. Yeah. Kaboom! <laughs> Woo! You're gay! Like, you have to be like, wow, it sounds like that might be hard for you. Yeah. Can you tell me more about what's going on, yeah. right? Yeah. But if they come streaming into your office like, I'm gay, I'm gay, <laughs> whoop, whoop, like, pull out the rainbow cannon. Like, uh -huh. even if you think being gay isn't the best thing, mm -hmm. right? Like, you have to stay where the client is mm -hmm. and not, like, no matter where you stand on the issue, you can't push or pull. Yeah. You have to kind of stick with them and, yeah. and figure it out. With the real list, their yeah. betterment, their safety. All right. Well, as was mentioned earlier, we do in the future, we'll, we'll hit the, the trans uh, community, transgender community, um, pretty, pretty heavy with another webinar and, and hopefully or another discussion or something. Um, but uh, we will uh, take any questions at this point. We that actually have mean, time. I yeah, didn't we, know what happened. Yeah, we have a little bit of time. So if there are any more questions or if team, if we've seen something come through that we'd like to actually address, we can do that. And then um, I will give Shane um, the floor to kind of wrap us up and any final words that you want to pull for. So this says, how can we help where specialists don't exist? So Yeah, I think um, making sure that, um, so one of the things I would say in general is that um, spaces need to be proactive. So if you haven't had a LGBT youth yet, right, um, that doesn't, you, you actually have. So that's point <laughs> yeah. one, you just don't know. <laughs> don't realize all right, um, and so two, like to think about your forms and your spaces and all of those things proactively, yeah. right? So if you don't have a specialist, um, start reading, right? Like start, start gathering information. Mm -hmm. Make sure that you know who you can consult with. Yeah. Um, and that uh, for the for trans specifically, um, the World Association for uh, uh, WPATH, World Professional Association on Transgender Health, so WPATH.org, are the keepers of what's called the standards of care. And the standards of care is the document that kind of leads people through transition. Okay. So look it up and, yeah. and read it and have a copy in your office. Yeah. Um, there are some good books out and about. Um, I can send you, I can send a list that you all can and post up. Mm -hmm. So it's about learning, it's about pre-learning yeah. because knowing that what I have found in several organizations where I've worked is if you make the space safe, they will come, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So it, it's important. Yeah. Uh, one more. Inter intersex suggests as though LGBTQ is something not normal. Is intersex different from LGBTQ? Yes. So some people you will see an acronym that's LGBTQIA, and the I is part of that. And I would say, um, I would, uh, normal is such a loaded, <laughs> normal, <laughs> normal is one of those like twitchy words for me. Um, Should have made the list. Right. <laughs> There's a, it's a long list of twitchy Shane words. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a medical condition in in the fact that like if you were diabetic or if you had high blood pressure, like it's yeah, it's something true. that your body does. Yeah. And um, the trick with intersex is if it's um, that often decisions are made on infants based on not enough information, right? Mm -hmm. So if there's a child that's born with what they talk about as kind of genital abnormalities, then they get surgically corrected, and sometimes they make a bad decision, mm -hmm. right? So politically, the intersex community is like, don't do any um, any unnecessary surgery. So if it's a medical necessity, yes. But if it's about cosmetics, like leave it alone, find out what the child's gender identity is, mm -hmm. sort it out later, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so I would say that in terms of advocacy, the intersex community is part of the LGBTQI because there are ways in which non-discrimination and some other places are, are helpful. Mm -hmm. And I would say that I know there are intersex folks who don't consider themselves 
part of the trans community, okay. right? And of course, if somebody's intersex identified, their sexual orientation may be anywhere along mm -hmm. the spectrum, right? Yeah. So again, they're not going to be linked. Yeah. So um, that that word "normal" is really tricky, mm -hmm. um, and and kind of who who gets to claim it and why? Define it, yeah. yeah. Let's see what. Um, it's okay to is it okay to admit youth are willing to learn? It's okay to admit youth are willing to learn. Ah, okay. Is it, <laughs> I was like, I'm not right. Is it okay to admit to the youth specifically that you're willing to learn? Yes, and then I think you get to ask. You know, I don't think we. So we've talked a lot about not assuming that people want to train you, yeah. right? Yeah. And there's a lot of power. I've worked with young people who are like. They want to train you, yeah. right? Because they are the experts on their lives, exactly. and they can't they can't train you about all things LGBT. But they may and be you. really I'm willing them. to to get you up to speed on them, yeah. right? Yeah. And so, um, yeah, I think it's better to admit you don't know than to fake your way yeah, through, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right? So to say, yeah. this is new to me. Yeah. How do you feel about that? Mm -hmm. Do we want to work together? Do you want me to find somebody who knows more yeah. than I do? Yeah. To like have informed consent yeah. about that yeah. is really important. Yeah. I think what's not good is to be like, oh my god, you're gay? Mm -hmm. Ugh, <laughs> gross. Ah, out of my office. Like yeah. that is not okay. So it, it, what, <laughs> what, I, what I've been making too broad of a term to say, um, I, I think, because I've worked with young people as well for quite a long time, um, I think young people that kind of a level of appreciation for them to let them be the experts of their lives right. no matter what the issue it may be that they're able to be the that experts and so me questioning or asking questions or learning and being able to admit i don't know right that that's a kind of a maybe a humbling place a place of humility before right. that person and and allow them to educate for who they right. are right. no matter what it is that's brought to right. the table right i mean i'll do that right do you think that's too general would that be i mean i think that's fair i think the other thing is you have to figure out what's going on in their life right like yeah. if they're like i just told my parents and i'm being kicked out of the house you don't want to say and what is it like for you to be gay yeah. right now it means for me to be homeless yeah exactly right? homeless, like, homeless, being homeless right. is the issue right, right. now right not right yeah. so i think it's about negotiating when and how to have that conversation yeah but I think I think humility in our practice is always important. Yeah. And if we the other thing is if we if we try to pretend we know, especially youth, mm. you're done. Yeah. Like they're they're going to sort that out yeah. really quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they and test I, you. And I'd like to say to, to put it out there that um, that there's questions that you would like to post that um, especially if you're maybe in a rural community, which I just came from, and there are very limited sources. There are uh, resources as far as um, peoples. Uh, persons, uh, people's, People. persons, um, available, and maybe there's more training or something else you would want specifically, please put those questions up because we can work with Shane to see what's out there, what's available, maybe something that we can provide um, to you specifically. Um, there are also a lot, there's some national orgs who are also willing to come and do work with yeah. local folks. Yeah. So. so the question, is there something clinicians or agencies can do to indicate they are a safe place or safe places? Yes. Uh, Yes and caution. <laughs> I think one is what is safe across the LGBTQ spectrum is different, right? So you may have done your work around gay and lesbian and bi identities, and you may not yet be ready for trans folks. And what I would say is um, uh, when you're doing your websites or your mes messaging, um, if you are not ready for trans clients, it's OK to say that you're LGB, LGB friendly. Mm -hmm. um, like I think it's tough to put the T in if you're if you're not there yet yeah. because you don't want to have trans folks come in and, and not have a good experience with you. Mm -hmm. We'll say one thing is because the trans community is small, bad experiences spread quickly. Yeah. And so if somebody's had a bad space someplace, you're done. Mm -hmm. Like they've told everyone. Yeah. So there's that piece. Um, I think being I think it's really um, I talk a lot about what it means to be an ally. Um, and a lot of times people will say an ally is a good friend and listener. And I'll say that I think that's a great starting place for an ally, but that an ally is also a person of action, right? So is your clinic, um, so for me, for a clinic to be a safe place is that everyone on staff is knowledgeable, that it isn't that you have an expert, because what often happens is somebody mm -hmm. walks into a lobby and the receptionist or the front desk person is a mess. Mm -hmm. But the clinicians behind are great. Mm -hmm. Well, my first 
point of access actually needs yeah. to be the safest person in that space, yeah. right? Yeah. So I think it's making sure that everybody's trained, that they're trained to be on the basics. Um, and you can come up with um, some kind of plaque or sign that, you know, has a, often they have a rainbow and say safe space or safe zone, or we have cards that say ally. Um, but like I, I hold a fairly um, high standard for what a safe place is. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing uh, we, I talk a, a lot about in different spaces is what does it mean for people in power to designate a space safe? Because um, I don't necessarily know what safety looks like for yeah, that person. Exactly, so yeah. it also, especially if you're working with young people in a way that you can get their input, mm -hmm. that'd be a great thing to yeah. do a faith focus group on. Yeah, yeah. Like what, what yeah. safety looks like for you yeah. and how are we doing? And you know, yeah. so you can put up placards. The other thing I would say to do is make sure, look at the pictures in your space. Are they all pictures of heterosexual couples or that have a really straight look and feel? Like mm -hmm. not okay. Do you have LGBT books and magazines in your space? Do you have uh, rainbowness in your space? <laughs> um, do you have really inclusive language on your forms? Um, so it's not just about design designating the space, it's about making sure that every way in which people interact with that, you know, kind of also all, all is in place. Yeah. And you'll notice on the webinar, I don't know that what I'm looking at is what you're looking at, so I'm <laughs> gonna make this up. But there's a file share space, maybe, yeah, hopefully. Okay, great. So there are really great links that also will have information about how you can uh, change and work um, your spaces um, and facts and tips and kind of all of those things. I tried to make sure that we had some of those things in place mm -hmm. so when we are quiet, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you, you can kind of continue right, yeah. the reading. Um, and if somebody lets you know that they have had, this is the other safe space piece maybe, is that if somebody comes to you and said, ooh, I had this thing happen, mm -hmm. um, to take that really seriously and to make sure that you're super quickly proactive and rectifying, yeah. you know, kind of whatever yeah. that yeah. is. So kind of continue that, there's specific, a specific question and maybe if there's something not on there, if you can give a, even a quick uh, okay. references. Or remember, as Shane said earlier, she, uh, here we're giving uh, these, I'm learning that, look at that, let me learn, um, information at the end. And so if there's some emailing of the specific questions or specific training, those kind of things uh, that you would like, you can do that and that'll be available after as well. Uh, but the question is, we're working to establish a safe zone program at the University mm -hmm. of Arkansas Yay. for medical services. Yeah. Um, do you guys recommend any resources to use in trainings? Um, for medical, specifically GLAMA, so it's the Gay and Lesbian Medical Association, so glma.org. Um, they have a lot of great resources on um, on kind of medical care. Um, I actually put together a handout of medical resources, so if you email me, I can send you uh, what those are. Because there, there's a whole, I think when you talk about LGBT community and medical stuff specifically, there's a whole nother layer of, com of complexity that happens um, that it would be great. And I have, um, I have the good fortune to be able to talk at our nursing school and some other places around health. So I'm happy to share what I can. Okay. All right, so we have one last one, um, just kind of a little away from the uh, resources, but, um, and then we'll let you just kind of close us out with any final thoughts that you may have. Sure. This one specifically says, are there any laws that protect intersex, in intersex Infants. Not in the United States. Uh, there, um, so Germany just made it so people don't have to um, put a gender, a sex, uh, uh, blah, blah, blah. so um, they, you can put, I think male or female or like unspecified, it's kind of creepy language, mm -hmm. but um, there's a way to not put, uh, so one of the things that's happening in the United States right now is on a birth certificate, you have to mark male or female. Mm -hmm. And so with intersex children, if their sex is a messy language, but unclear, mm -hmm. right, you have to choose. Mm -hmm. um, and so, no, there are not a lot of protections. Um, there are no protections in the United States, um, and it, it's a problem. And I think, you know, one of the things that happens if, is if you have a baby that's born and the doctor comes to you and says, you know, we want to let you know that there's something going on with your child, your first thing is going to say like, oh my God, what is it and what do we do, yeah. right? And if a doctor's thing is, in my medical opinion, you should, you're rarely going to say, 
I was on a webinar with Shane that said, maybe we should wait and talk about that, right? Um, that you're just going to say, of, of course, like, go ahead, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, and that the medical, the, so the work has been to help the medical profession understand um, what happens when the wrong decision is made. Yeah. And I think one of the other things that is changing a little bit is more, I've started hearing that more people are getting chromosomal testing early, and so that also would be helpful. But even, right, again, if we go back to the beginning mm -hmm. um, and we talk about, you know, kind of biological sex versus gender identity, even if we were to test chromosomes and, mm -hmm. and um, hormones and look at genitals and do all of that, the person's gender identity still may be different, you yeah. know, as they grow up. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. tri it's tricky yeah. and it's complicated. And, you know, we just don't like ambiguity. Like we're a society that doesn't like ambiguity oh, yeah. at all, and so gen and and we think of gender as being so fixed, and mm -hmm. so gender ambiguity, mm -hmm. either on a biological or a psychological level, I think mm -hmm. just really um, terrifies people. Mm -hmm. And it's so glor it's glorious. Yeah. <laughs> so what what final thoughts? It's been I have really enjoyed this. Um, so what final thoughts would you leave our folks with um, today? Uh, so thank you very much for uh, hanging out on your computers with us for a while. That's great. Um, I think final thoughts are, again, to be proactive, right, to um, start having the conversations with people in your, in your lives and in your agencies and all of the places um, bef before a crisis, <laughs> yeah. um, to know that um, just because we have Modern Family and Ellen DeGeneres and some <laughs> lovely things um, that we didn't have when I came out, uh, there's still so much. There's still so much work to be done, mm -hmm. and that we can't kind of take that for granted. I think the other thing that I that we I think you and I talked about that that uh, didn't kind of come out in this is that one of the things I often hear people say is that well, you know, um, kind of homosexuality is a is a private thing, mm -hmm. right? That why, why, do, why do we have to talk about that? Well, we, you know, heterosexual folks, heterosexuality is not a private thing. It, it, there are public displays of heterosexuality <laughs> everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, bachelor, bachelorette, reality <laughs> TV, big weddings, all the things, all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and that people openly talk about their relationships mm -hmm. all the time. Yeah. And that you, you just don't think about it because it's in the air we breathe. Yeah. So, you know, my vision for the world uh, one of my visions, I have many visions for the world, um, but one of my visions for the world is that, you know, um, gay, lesbian, and bisexual folks can as openly talk about our lives and that people would be interested um, in finding out, you know, if I'm in a relationship and where we met and how long we've yeah. been together and where we like to go on vacation and where we eat and that I would get to have a picture of my partner and I on my desk and it wouldn't cause a riot, mm -hmm. right? Or that if um, there was a company party that I wouldn't have to think to ask, like, is it okay if I bring my partner? Mm -hmm. That people would say, man, I really hope you and your partner show up at the party, yeah. right? That, that there's this way of going, not out of our way in a, like, icky way. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that it would just be part of our, the way that we work in the world that, um, that, that all of who I am would be fully included. Um, and so... You know, to think about what that would look like within your settings, mm -hmm. I think, you know, is great. And to know that, you know, people are having to navigate, again, that kind of that, their levels of outness. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I'm super out of school, but I'm not out at home. Yeah. And I'm out on Facebook, but I'm not out mm -hmm. here, you know, and, and that the amount of energy it takes to, just kind of navigate yeah. all of that is really exhausting. Yeah. And so to make sure that in your spaces, um, people are not having to navigate that, yeah. that they can just, you know, kind of be all in. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of times for gender nonconforming folks, uh, especially folks who are in clinical settings, it may be the only place that they get to use the name and pronouns that they want to. Mm -hmm. And even if all that means is for an hour and a week, they get to like use that name and those pronouns and try different things on. Yeah. Um, Trying things on, I guess, is one other thing, is that oftentimes I hear people say, well, you know, last week they said they like this, and this week they say they like that, and can't they just, well, and it's a phase, and blah, blah, blah. you know, for the first 24 years of my life, heterosexuality was a phase. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, you it, 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 I did. It took me a long time. Um, but, you know, part of developmentally, you know, for our youth is that they're supposed to be trying things exactly. on, right? Exactly. And we don't, we don't necessarily judge them on other things, right? But somehow the sexual orientation or who they find attractive or interested or how they talk about their lives, we have a lot more judgment about. Yeah. Um, and there's, not, there's no harm. Mm -hmm. There shouldn't be. There shouldn't be any harm in people's kind of working through that yeah. act actively. Yeah. Um, and I and the other thing that you know we didn't talk about because we didn't talk a lot about bisexuality in this is that there's a lot of kind of biphobia both in the straight community and in the gay and lesbian community. And so I think if you have people who are um, kind of questioning around bisexuality to um, just listen and be supportive and not try to push or pull or not to ask them what they really are or not to say that they're doing it for attention. Like mm -hmm. there's so much bad languaging that happens when people are in a question about bisexuality that really what they need is like, you know, cool, thanks for letting me know. What yeah. do you need? <laughs> yeah. You know, how's that working for yeah. you? Yeah. You know, again, to just, um, and I think uh, when people come out to you, uh, there's some interesting things that people say that I know are really well intentioned that usually don't land well. Like, um, oh, that's okay with me. Well, what message is that kind of sending, right? So when people come out, it's a, you know, thank you for letting me know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, again, do, is, it, is there anything that you need, but mm -hmm. not in assuming that their life is falling apart, yeah, kind yeah, of going yeah. back to it being the issue yeah. or not. Um, because I think sometimes um, the things that we say often come across as, a, as permission granting, mm -hmm. um, and I don't need anybody to grant me permission to be who I am. And so yeah. just, again, to be mindful of, about kind of how those things land. So. All right. Well, Shane, again, thank you very much. Sure. Um, and st please stay tuned. We will continue uh, the yeah. series on the word. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, and so... Um, we will soon be uh, fleshing out a, um, a list of what other aspects of culture do we want to discuss. Um, and so if there's some things when it comes around, the, uh, specifically around culture that you would love to see um, or have more information on or um, maybe even having a presentation or discussion on, uh, definitely put that in the questions and we'll see if we can address that as well. So I'm going to turn it back over to Robert, and thank you guys so much for participating. Hold on. Is my email address on the next slide? Oh, yeah. yeah. we got one more slide. Just, let's, just to make sure it's like we promised, and now we're not. Oh, there, there we, we go. go. So it's just my full name at gmail.com. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that uh, great discussion, Michael and Shane. We appreciated it, and I don't know about all the other webinar attendees, but I learned a lot myself, so thank you all so much for that. Um, as Michael mentioned briefly, don't forget to keep an eye out for our upcoming webinars. This one was great. There was a lot going on in the chat box, so we'll have another webinar coming soon. Um, please complete the post-webinar survey by either clicking, clicking on the survey link that was populated, and I'll do it here again shortly. But also, at the end of this webinar, it will probably pop up when you close out. Don't forget to do that. And if you need CEUs, there's a question for you to upload your or type in your email address. Please don't forget to do that as well so that we can be sure that we email you a copy of the CEUs. Once again, all the PowerPoint slides and handouts can be downloaded to your computer from the file share pod, which is located on the left side of your screen. And on behalf of the Texas System of Care team, I would like to thank the presenters. So thank you, Michael, and thank you, Shane. And also on behalf of the presenters today and the Texas System of Care team, I would like to thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar and look forward to seeing you at our future and upcoming webinars. And don't forget to share us with your friends and family by following us on Facebook at facebook.com slash care. And also please check out our website for more information at www.txsystemofcare.org. Thank you so much and have a great day.